Good evening, and once again, welcome to Poets Corner here at Scarrett Bennett Center. We're very happy this evening to have with us Dr. Brenda Buka. Brenda is a retired physician, but believe it or not, she's been writing since she was a child. She likes to tell of the events of ordinary life of gardening, even of her patients, and always gives us a picture of what she seals, sees and how she feels. Brenda and her husband live on a farm near Nashville. They have three daughters and they have just become the proud grandparents of two granddaughters. Let us welcome Brenda. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, I, well, I really want to thank Joyce for being the animating spirit behind uh, Poets Corner for all these years. And I hear she's leaving, which I'm sorry about. And I thank Scarrett Bennett and Michael Vaughn, who's our videographer. So, uh, and all of you out there in what we used to call Radio Land um, who are listening. Um, I do write a lot of poems about my place and ordinary people. Uh, today, uh, I've been thinking back on our personal landscapes and how they've changed, how that's changed over the last year, and how limited travel and socializing has been. So, I've decided that my theme today is other people, other places. So I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm reading travel poems, although some of them are travel close to home. Um, I'm going to start with a poem about our area, Bell's Bend, and there are a few references here. Uh, one, uh, there are references to fire and ice and the burning down of our house, which happened uh, 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 six years ago. On the coldest day of the year, there was an ice storm, and our house burned to the ground. Uh, also, there are references to Guy Owens, who was an old man who used to live in a little tiny house uh, right where the Lewis Country Store is right now. Uh, and those of us who have lived there long enough, think about him. The ghosts who populate our landscape are still there for us. So this is called Bell's Bend. Coming over Guy Owens Hill, that's what we call it, still is coming home, even homeless. Even after our house exploded in a column of smoke, even after everyone gathered on the frozen road to watch our world vibrate sadly between fire and ice, even then, coming over Guy Owens Hill, we come home to this one place and no other. Coming over Guy Owens Hill, racing along the sunset dappled, radio addled thread of rush hour, the air feels different. We know we are in this one place and no other. We slow down to catch up on the invisible news, watch the little green heron poking at the creek sort the mail, talk about fence repairs, how to kill privet, collect asparagus, call Di and her dog to dinner, expect at least someone to drop in. We know who packs a pistol and with whom we disagree on practically everything, except that the kitchen door is always open and there's a bit of whiskey on the shelf over the, over the fridge. Coming over Guy Owens Hill, that is what we call it, because instead of the gas station, its pumps, its skittles, its lotto signs, we still see a little white house on the corner. That strange old man, known for his skin flint ways, and the old woman who lived with him when his Parkinson's took over, because he was too cheap, people said, to buy a marriage license that one time he maybe fell in love 60 years ago. 
Coming over Guy Owens Hill, there are always ghosts in this one place and no other, living in the stories we tell. Old Frank in his red suspenders plows the sunset with his white mule. A girl in a kerchief swings on our vanished porch. The handsome captain, shell-shocked in Vietnam, threading his platoon mostly to safety through knife grass and mud, repeats his guilt and shame over killing a woodpecker and gets older with neater and neater lawns. Ms. Andrews March snow water in a clean quart jar under the sink was good for burns, she said, bless her heart. These days, coming over Guy Owens Hill, there's a new fence raised in a cold drizzle by a crowd while vultures farmed, fanned the farms below, wings spread like fingers in a mockery of blessing. The tomato sandwiches on the porch are served on a tray of sweat and chiggers and sunburned knees. Water comes in pipes that froze last winter. There are new neighbors with their stories still in front of them. The old men lean over a tractor with a couple of young chaps in dirty overalls and somebody else's three-year-olds run in the creek mesmerized by toads. It is still here, this one place and no other, still here, unbroken because it was never perfect, dusty, that place for mechanics and rusty shovels and old friends. This one place isn't all that special, just a hollow and a creek like everywhere. But it was what we had, and we traded it back and forth, took care of each other's children, tended our celebrations and disappointments, wept and sang. Find the place, make it, let it make you. You can love what you do not like, even enjoy what you, do, what you cannot love. Tell stories the same old ones over and over. The new ones about smashed jars of tomato sauce that time the cupboard fell off the wall. Truant sheep in your spring garden. Or smoke and fire and who called who on that terrible day. Open the door, bring inside, feed. It takes all the time we have, doesn't it, to make this one place and no other. Uh, that's Bell's Bend. We're in our new house. And uh, now that it's towards the end of this pandemic, the door is open. And I can tell you where the whiskey is. Um, the next poem it gives uh, some ideas about why we leave Bell's Bend for other places. It's uh, overtly a drink about a drink in one of Hemingway's favorite bars in Havana, a bar called Ambos Mundos, which means both worlds. But it's really a little story about why we leave and where we go. This is called Pilgrims in Trouble Now, or Deconstructing Drinks in Ambos Mundos, Havana. Pilgrims are gone extinct, even here, where palm fronds rattle beside the balcony. Stories of the wandering years, adventures taking us to a rueful wisdom or revolution or sainthood. These tales are only spoken in faded languages in huddled rooms. The narrative thread has frayed and broken. The novel is dead, and so is the old man. Only, sometimes, unkempt longing uncurls itself, walks its thousand tiny claws along the hallways of my heart. Before I can weep or rage or pack, 
It's curled up again, inert as a stone in the lower left-hand corner of myself. There is a reason why all of us sit at the bar in Hemingway's Hotel with a seven-year-old rum and maybe a cigar. But sometimes an evening at home around the kitchen table is a journey in itself with our friends and family. And uh, this poem is called Kitchen. It talks about a coracle. Coracles are round, lightweight boats. They're woven sort of like a basket, a shallow basket, and covered with skin or canvas uh, used in Ireland and Wales and also other countries around the world. And the word core in Latin means heart. And so that's what this always reminds me of, although in fact the word coracle is not derived from the Latin heart. So, but anyhow, those are the associations. So this is called kitchen. Frail coracle, this basket of light cupped around the table. We discussed the storm, the depth of water, the path opening towards sunrise told the same old stories, wove new ones from the fragile threads of daylight and dark, traveled through the trembling night, rowing together toward morning. A handful of whiskey lighting the way speckled like a glass of stars. We came in and went out, sat in this frail coracle of my heart, woven of sticks, circling. Such a slender place to dwell so small, we should not still be afloat on this unimaginable sea. I'm noticing I've got a lot of whiskey in these poems. I, <laughs> uh, I don't want you to think that that's all we do, but um, anyway, a little taste once in a while is a good thing. A few years ago, we took a trip to Sri Lanka, which used to be known as Ceylon. It's the uh, island that sort of the island nation off the point of India. And uh, I wrote a suite of poems about that trip, so I'm gonna read all of them here. And uh, we start in the airport and uh, reflect a little bit on the weirdness of travel in a modern jet airplane. So this is prologue, middle passenger starting in the airport. Messages come to us, announced. We check times, buy a paper, rush along the moving walkway, watch thumb-sized maps that show our airplane pointed over Egypt, the location of Mecca. And we think airspeed, temperature outside, minus 40 and falling. Old movies, the latest news, the menu, all this information is worth something, or why would it be here, dangling like oxygen masks in the video? We reach for the promise, the illusion, for safety, exhausted, sleeping, not sleeping, packed into this tin can with our swollen feet. We are, we continue to be, between, nowhere, here, but the day, the day folded into an envelope of sky, dropped into the Atlantic. The day vanishes. Day one in Colombo. So we arrived at about two in the morning and uh, there were some uh, oddities uh, at, at the airport and on the way to the hotel. Um, it was shortly after Christmas and there were Christmas decorations everywhere, which was not what we expected. And also the Pope had just made a visit to Sri Lanka and was about to leave. Um, this part of the poem also mentions sambol, which is a Sri Lankan condiment made of grated coconut, chili peppers, red onions. Uh, so here we are landing in the Colombo airport and being whisked away to our first hotel. Day one, Colombo. It's a steamy night. Visa, stamp, passport, money changer. 
We can't explain the Christmas trees, refrigerators, and washing machines for sale at 3 a.m. in duty free. The different world we looked for, the same old Jack Daniels stacked in golden pyramids, the same strangeness of exhaustion drawn across the faces, women in saris blankly holding hands with their dark-eyed children waiting, watching. A display of reindeer outlined in lights. The airport Buddha, neon halo beaming, unmoved by his gifts of flowers, monitors our drive away. The Pope is just leaving, we are warned. Traffic will be bad until late. Some bowl, says the breakfast waiter, and my scrambled eggs are better for it. A twisted tamarind tree whispers the ragged elegance of age to the breeze, the scree of raking and sweeping which maintain perfection here. This fairy tale hotel, which none of us deserve and are slightly embarrassed to be part of, but we love it. We could stay here forever, apologetic, lazy, and content. A groom and his men pose under the palms like kings shining in jeweled jackets with puff sleeves and long skirts, four-cornered hats turning this way and that for the photo shoot. The bride's ivory silk, her, orange, her, orchid, corsa, her orchid bouquet. Japanese tourists and I are astonished voyeurs. The itinerary reads, transfer to Kitugala. Neglects to mention all of the everyday between here and there. We are shocked, charmed, wounded, alive, worn through. Laundry strung along the empty, unfinished second floor rooms. Men hitching up their sarongs to get on a bike, ride a motorcycle. The road teeming with lives all unimaginable, punctuated by the comma-shaped dogs slowly unfurling and resettling. Everything worn out, brand new, shiny, about to be finished, probably abandoned, half-built, the shapes of all dreams everywhere. That's part of what's so fun about traveling. Uh, this poem is called Natural History, and it is about a hike in the King's Forest, which is on a mountain above the city of Candy. And uh, it does reference the world's smallest snake. On our trip, we were very privileged to have a fantastic herpetologist along, and he uh, found this and many other wonders for us. The world's smallest snake is about uh, this long but it's a snake, it's not a worm. We got to see it. And it also references uh, the bun man. In Sri Lanka, everywhere there are tuk-tuks, which are these three-wheeled little rickshaws. And the bun man's tuk-tuk has a glass box on the back with pastries in it. So, and it has a little uh, calliope, kind of like the ice cream man or something. So here we are, natural history. In the king's forest, you hold the world's smallest snake, blind. Its tiny tongue tastes the air, wondering what is this thing, the plane of your palm, this warm thing? And where is dinner? Where are the termite eggs in this strange place that does not feel like leaves? Signs point to the monk's retreat. Enchanted, we track the tiny deer galloping through the trees. That hole, a pangolin was here. And the calliope sound of the bun man plays furry lease over and over in the streets below. We already know his fly-specked glass box, his three-wheel throne. This is called Wilpatu. 
Wilpatu is a wildlife preserve, and that's where, uh, well, there were other places in Sri Lanka too, but leopards, elephants. You go around a corner in your little wildlife truck, and there's wild peacocks displaying. Uh, it was pretty spectacular. Wilpatu. The eye contact is electric through my binoculars. He is looking at me, living his perfect leopard life, satisfied, muscular, smug. I know this is illusion, the illusion of soul, his, mine, the craving to be pinned here, watching and watched, still on the wheel of desire. Um, so Sri Lanka is mainly a Buddhist country, although there are some, there is a Hindu minority and uh, also a significant Christian minority since it was colonized by the Portuguese in the 17th century. Um, so there are Buddhas everywhere and they're often very, very gaudy, which is, it's just fun. Well, it's just fun. Uh, so this is called Neon Buddha. At the crossroads, Buddha sits in his glass box, his neon halos blinking on and off, making us stop and consider which path, which path. But the absence of desire would leave us here, balanced perfectly at the crossing. A barefoot man leaves a flower, brings hands together, pointing to heaven, bows, and goes about his business which is carrying a bucket down the right-hand road. In his glass box, Buddha sits in the market square. Every stall decked out, red and green bouquets of brooms, a row of motorcycles dusted every day, chandeliers of crisp packets, emerald cigarette boxes, bright skirts, aspirin, motor oil, buckets, orange sodas, Bunches of bananas, a pile of guavas, purple eggplant, basketball shorts pinned to a clothesline, nine kinds of rice in big bags looking like squat judges in the grocery shop. The street man fries up his chicken rolls, his sweets in crackling oil. The fish man on a bicycle, a box on the back, a set of scales, pans swinging on both sides, as he pedals along, advertising honesty and commerce, an ancient form of justice. Behind gleaming glass, Dialogue, the cell phone company, coaxes talk everywhere. An elaborate mosaic of advertising decorates the stalls, tiled, brilliant, a designer's paradise. Horlicks, health for the entire family, sunbright English classes, blow up swim rings, ducks, plastic toys from China mathematically arranged. Boys in blue school ties bend over the motorcycles. Girls cluster around the ice cream man, chattering, chattering. Yellow pie dogs sleep in the sun. A sign announces, you are proceeding to the abode of the god Kataragama. We peep into it all, deceived as always about what we understand. I don't really know what Buddha wants, but what he gets is all this. This peacock world's dirty, hurrying, clever, cheap, preening. He doesn't care what I know, knowing that knowing is not the issue here. Buddha is okay with it, wants only enlightenment, and he knows that is hard. He has been down the Eightfold Path. Neon halos blinking in his glass box, Buddha sits at the crossroads. The day vanishes. This poem is called Negumbo. Negombo is a um, 
I would describe as uh, a low, a working class town just outside Colombo, where we were housed in a much less glamorous hotel the day before we flew out because they didn't need to impress us anymore. Uh, Negumbo is on the, the ocean, so there are there was a beach, and I wandered around the town uh, and uh, wound up on a uh, littered beach, which was right behind a pink church with concrete stations of the cross in the sand. Uh, also, um, this reference is Arak. That's an alcoholic drink across Southeast Asia. It can be made out of a lot of things like coconut or uh, red rice or whatever. And Tom, my husband, got a haircut there in the gumbo in a tiny, shabby little concrete room right off opening onto the sidewalk. So these are all in this poem, Negumbo. Swimming in their clothes, a family calls to each other, wraps the baby in a towel, fishes in the surf, string wound around a soda bottle. Behind the big pink church, 12 concrete crosses mark Jesus' progress on his last day. Numbered, tilted, stained, rooted here in litter, Eric bottles, Chinese cigarette packs, plastic bottle caps, paper in three languages. Ragged boys play cricket with an old bat and a cast off chair as a wicket, run slowly through the heavy sand. Hands fluttering around Tom's head like feathers, the haircut proceeds. The trim, a careful straight razor shave, the head massage. Ayurvedic medicine, madame, applied with quartz crystal to clean pink cheeks. He is a master, smiling. His pant legs pool too long around bare feet in his dim blue room. The day vanishes. And this is the last day as we head to the airport and back home. Midnight streets lit with a neon cross atop the pink church, a butter lamp inside St. Anthony's glass box. The holiday lights at the airport are gone. We roll our baggage our wheelchair, someone is ill, through our own glass box, starting our journey of perpetual light, chasing the sun back home, clocks clashing, the day vanishes. That was a pretty wonderful trip. Uh, so travel, being a tourist specifically reminds us of worlds that we do not understand and we shouldn't pretend that we understand them. I think this idea of being a tourist is interesting. You're kind of looking in on other worlds. But uh, sometimes when we come home we realize there are worlds here that we don't understand either uh, and that there's strangeness all around us all the time. Uh, this poem is called The Bridge Inspector and it's a factual account of flooding on Pecan Valley Road, which is the next little road to the left past our house. And uh, in fact, it's still flooding. This poem was written several years ago, but I was walking there. It flooded after this last rain. Um, and this is why. The bridge inspector. Because, and oh, and uh, you know, the cure for the strangeness isn't always what we think. So the city built a big new culvert thinking that would manage the flooding, but of course, that's not the cause of the flooding, so. Uh, because six men in yellow vests are repairing the culvert, lining the scour holes with rocks, pouring cement. Their gloves make dark pyramids as they lean on their shovel handles in the sun. I must tell them they will have to do this again because 30 years ago, the county bridge inspector lived at the end of the road, weighed 500 pounds, maybe six, was known for mostly good advice, although his stepdaughters, 
not his, his second wife's, were known for being foolish and for killing both their husbands with cyanide at a poker game. Because 30 years ago, the bridge inspector's mostly good advice was concrete bridges poured over 48-inch pipes, which in every large rain clog like a beaver dam. Sticks, a gas can, two socks, one pink, a rusty tricycle, a mountain's worth of worn-out leaves, because two neighbors upstream have these bridges. And so the road will flood again in a brown torrent. Because six men in yellow vests are building a memorial they do not know, but every rain, whether we know or not, will sing once more this requiem of rushing water in memoriam. Bridges that become walls, water that becomes a hammer and always finds a way. Takes along things that do not want to go because we will tell the story, his weeping legs, his waterlogged heart. Um, this is called Stranger on a Plane. Uh, again, this whole idea of how something as peculiar as plane travel is made to feel very ordinary. Uh, so I was out west and met a young man who was a horse trader, and uh, we had a great talk. And he told me, among other things, that uh, he bought a pony for his five-year-old daughter named Kid Rock, and he says, Heck no, my daughter's, my little girl's not going to have anything named Kid Rock. That pony's name is Princess. So that was pretty funny. We sat next to each other on the plane into Denver. Stranger on a plane. How strange to find it normal, not worth mentioning, that a patch of pinpoint light is an entire town. That as we tilt westward across the Mississippi, the river is written an inch wide across the window, its oxbows and islands smaller than my hand. How strange to pretend we understand 38,000 feet, or 17 degrees below zero, or that pretzels and ginger ale are supposed to make this as ordinary as late afternoon sitting by the little table on the patio back home. The man next to me is a horse dealer, and tomorrow he will either be infinitesimal, too small to see from my seat flying out of Denver, or life-size, coaxing four geldings and a chestnut mare onto the trailer, loading a bale of hay and a bag of sweet feed, checking the tires and driving to a ranch in Los Alamos. I'm calculating. I think we could fit 20, maybe 25 horses here. And some of that smell of sweat and dirt and nicked leather and the murmur of the herd would shuffle me off to sleep. Coffee would be poured lukewarm from a dented thermos. And this sun sunburned man with his dusty ball cap, his ginger beard, and the five-year-old daughter who has a horse named Princess would still be life-size. Um, photography is one of the things about travel that's very strange. You think you've captured something, but not really. Um, this is called Guide, and uh, it depicts a moment on one of the tributaries of the Amazon in Peru. Guide. Romero, his silent wife, dipping a rag into the thick brown river. His children, a boy, a girl, sucking on sugar cane fly into my camera like moths in a revelation of light. Will come with me home, looking I know not what thoughts down to me as I stand forever on the riverbank, point and shoot a family and a green boat. Uh, this is called The Redhead and the Guide by Lamplight. And again, it's in Amazonian Peru. 
and uh, describes a moment where worlds are meeting and crossing. And in the Amazon, you cannot preserve paper or photographs or any of the things that we think of as history uh, unless you wrap them in plastic and put them in uh, something that uh, uh, has dehydrator in it and so on. And I was watching one of the guides flirting kind of seriously uh, with a grad student who was doing research at a field station and thinking about their worlds and their different expectations. The Redhead and the Guide by Lamplight. He has rowed for days up the river in a dugout shaped curved like a leaf. He sharpens darts on piranha teeth, dyes them in a black sauce from a complicated recipe. He knows that poetry melts in the jungle like bones, that memory is a mirage, that the heart's songs must be wrapped carefully in plastic, that poison is the best way to kill, that most things disappear, leave no footprints, slide under a slab of coffee-colored water, that for a day there will be a radiant fungus pleated like an organdy collar, and then nothing. Gringos don't want to believe this. They think they can leave something behind. In their world, grandma's souvenirs are in the attic. Poetry will always be on a shelf somewhere. He has fixed on her to live forever or to be someone in the mind of someone who thinks he can. He has hung this notion on a child's idea of love. Motionless in the searchlight of his desire, she dives suddenly into her sinking heart. There is nothing immutable about the river. There can be no tombstones where there are no stones. The Indians plant a purple croton on the grave. None of it is about love. It's all about light, tiny in the wilderness of darkness. We gather around our kerosene lantern, caught in a lariat of light. He is trying to enter her world just as she is leaving it. Souls feel different, trapped in a net of golden light, rocking in a hammock of light, fluttering in a globe of light, unzipping a chrysalis of light, brown strings dangling from a balloon of light, red hair electric in a bonfire of light, nothing left but the smell of light. That also references one of the astonishing things that I noticed when we were on the Amazon and in other places, is that how dark it is where they're, when you're out in the wild and how a pinpoint of light means there are human beings over there and, it's, um, and it becomes so uh, vital. Um, sometimes even the news, though, seems like a different world. Uh, this is called A Wash, and it's based on a quote from the New Yorker, which said, quotes, The world is awash in new fortunes since the 90s, when Silicon Valley began mining, minting billionaires. The world is awash in new fortunes. No one told the people on our road. Asphalt still hollowed out after last year's flood. The only thing we have been awash in. Robert needs a loan to keep the electric on. His brain awash in static, but he's back on the Dilantin. We'll fix the truck, clean the windows, the screens need putting up. Short circuit it is always, sparking between forever despair and bitter hope. The foster granddaughter awash in fuck yous, no warm work gloves yet, his lost telescope, his stolen tools, that no good brother-in-law who took his guns for oxy. 
He used to dream about the stars, stay up late to watch them reeling, crackling through heaven. Today he dreams, twitching in his sleep, about 20 years ago, when for $18 an hour he fixed cars and was damn good at it. Um, this is called Reincarnation in North Island, and this is in New Zealand. I'm imagining the crisp sort of ocean world of the Shearwater, which is this gorgeous, very crisply defined ocean bird, and how that life must be very different from the uh, murkier, nostalgic, heartbreak life on land. So that's the... Uh, uh, and it does mention the totoras, which are um, a New Zealand tree. Uh, there are forests of them. Reincarnation on North Island. Diving through silent skies, under wing outlined like an Egyptian eye, tailored, trim, a chevron, a chevron captain of the frozen air, the sheer water, turns on a wingtip to tango with the greenstone sea, an exhilaration of cliffs and scrolling waves brilliant as mirrors torn only by the seagull's cry. A relief, a joy to be immune from heart lift, palm dapple, the stained glass fall of light through the totoras on an afternoon, the bellbird's plangent song. Uh, this is called Destinations, and um, it's set somewhere in Central America. Anyone who travels knows that no airport road ever goes through a lovely section of town. And uh, you can always learn something by looking out the window along the airport road. Destinations, there's two parts. Just before midnight, after the last flight in, along the airport road, she hangs her apron on the nail behind the icebox, scoops the coins off the oilcloth into the empty cup of her hand. His square belt buckle blossoms in a runnel of reflected light, framed with both hands tenderly as the man hitches up his cheap, cheap pants. She carries the last bottles, dull and brown as roots, carefully each to its little box. Metal shutters unfold for her like wings. She turns the bolt. The virgin, flame, framed in plastic, no larger than a thumbnail, hangs from the key ring slips into the cotton pocket of her dress. She starts down the airport road. The man waits, blossoming dangerously in the thick night. Part two. Tired, the tourist leans against the window. Whatever she may say, it has already been worth the trip just to see framed in this strange blue light, these seamless lives that fit like simple skin, or at least to tell herself that is what she's seen. And I'm going to close about a poem um, based, this is called Okronos Bastardos. And this was Greek graffiti, which I saw painted on a bench at the foot of the Acropolis. I mean, this is really true. How can this happen? But there it was. Uh, I have not found any reference to literature or a saying where it might have come from. Uh, but I'm translating it as that bastard time, OK? And the Acropolis, of course, we all know the Parthenon and how beautiful and exquisite and exquisitely turned the parts of the Parthenon are. But around the base of the Acropolis, 
Uh, number one, there's Mars Hill, which is where Paul preached. And then around the base, there are also caves and uh, places where for many centuries uh, there's been cult worship, including uh, places for uh, Aphrodite and Eros, the gods of love, and Pan, uh, and some other, uh, Apollo and Zeus. Um, when, we, when I was at the Parthenon the last time, I was really struck by the fact that there were so many young people. It was in the fall, so there were very few Americans, lots of people from the Far East, um, and uh, everyone was taking selfies. And the young men, the girls were posing like fashion models, and the young men were photographing, and that was uh, a lot of what was happening in the, uh, in the Parthenon when we were there. So this is uh, Okronos Bastardos, Greek graffiti on a bench at the Acropolis. Time that slick bastard catches us on the cusp of the mountain. Pan's cave vibrating below, his goaty feet still tap dancing up the marble steps in the stone light like honey in air. Young men strung along the path, gazing at their girls, coy, posing in the wind, coquettish hands on hips, hands and sunglasses tipped into the sun, and Aphrodite shimmers, all the prettier for her thousands of years, clicks the photo button. They lean towards each other, cute smile for the computer on the selfie stick, check. All they see is each other. All they will take home are images of each other, innocent idols on vacation an evasion of time, unaware that time, that slippery bastard, drops his spells here and everywhere, reminds Pericles every day that perfection is hardly forever, cheers on Paul's wrecking ball of sin and redemption, shouted from this same hill, we sit on ancient stones, security wallets hanging under our clothes, while time, that cheap bastard, squanders his millennia on that ingrate Apollo and cannot spare for any of us an extra day. That's it. Thank you all.